if we didn't have the plays, what would be Shakespeare's status is, I guess, the question, right? And I look at the sonnets and I look at the, the kinds of thematic concerns that Shakespeare has in the plays and I see, I see many connections. So I suppose if we didn't have the plays, I don't think that we would look at Shakespeare the way we do, since that might be where um, the greater emphasis of his work on his work is rightly placed. Maybe I think I, I could agree with that. But um, we're talking about form and Shakespeare. I think in the sonnets is experimenting with form, and in his plays is ex experimenting with form. Every tragedy is constructed differently. Um, and every sonnet, I think, um, has a different construction as well. So I would say that um, I think he took the Petrarchan sonnet and even turned it into the anti-sonnet in some ways, if that makes sense, that, that he was not satisfied with form. He's not satisfied with, I think, the kind of cult of romance that surrounded the Petrarchan sonnet. And, and one of the directions where he takes it dramatically is that he has characters who are um, pursuing the kind of perform, uh, pursuing the roles that you would expect um, somebody who had bought into the conventions of those sonnets to pursue, but then he's critiquing it, right? So, so if you look at Romeo and Juliet's popularity, you know, Romeo is playing roles associated with the, the whole tradition of love associated with the sonnet, right? And, and uh, what Shakespeare shows, of course, is that maybe those ring hollow, maybe they're maybe they're dangerous <laughs> and in some way as well when someone of Romeo's sensibility and an experience takes a hold of them and his rashness, his lack of um, self-control gets a hold of that tradition and it takes a destructive um, uh, path. One, that's one reading of Romeo and Juliet. I, I, I think there are different readings. I, there is, of course, the reading that sees the play as um, a... Um, affirmation of the ennobling role of romantic love and that sort of Romeo and Juliet transcend. They rise above the um, conflicts of their families to create some kind of important ennobling legacy. And I think that's true. But the other way of looking at Romeo is that he's rash um, you know, when you know, he, he, he doesn't take time to think out the situation that he's in. Um, he kills Paris just so he can get down into the tomb and die, which seems a little bit ridiculous. So I think one of the things that I think is interesting in the connection with, between the sonnets and the, and the play, uh, Romeo and Juliet in particular, um, is that Shakespeare's aware in two different ways. I mean, I, 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 we could talk about his understanding of cultural paradigms, right? And how he pursues a critique of those cultural paradigms. I think one of those paradigms is, is literary culture and the way in which we see Shakespeare um, seeing the way in which people are imitating Right? Imitation is another theme that's found throughout Shakespeare and that, that people are playing roles, right? The, you know, all the world's a stage and we're all just actors on the stage or Macbeth's um, Life's But a Walking Shadow, a poor play that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and is heard no more. That kind of use of theatrical language to understand how we're playing cultural roles, how Romeo in effect plays a literary role. That role brings him into collision with reality in a way that kills him. Juliet even says to him, you kiss by the book, mm -hmm. which I assume That's means you've been reading a lot of Petrarch. Exactly, uh, yeah, yeah. So could you say that perhaps they had read too many sonnets that had not been written by Shakespeare, that didn't have his level of complexity? There's a, a complexity or something that overturns what has been said before. Um, in some way questioning it, right? So I think Romeo's uncritical adoption of a romantic um, frame of reference is, you could say, to his detriment, um, and, and to Juliet's too, although I think she's read less of it. She's more rational than he is, I think, actually. I, I think she's much more sensible. Interestingly, there's one point where she says, whoa, wait, slow down. <laughs> you need to think this through, and she's the one who actually has to sometimes put a hold on him, but... Well, he had to kill off Mercutio, didn't he, in order for Romeo to continue to 
live by the book of the love sonnet. Right. He, you couldn't have had that ending if Mercutio were still around to... Yes, set, set Ex- exactly. I mean, I think that's why dramatically Mercutio has to, has to die before um, Romeo really kind of takes it um, to an extreme. Once that counterbalancing uh, perspective of love as sexual desire and as romantic love as a um, idealization of, of lust, so to speak. Um, I think that's when Romeo really uh, takes it to an extreme and all of the, the destructive consequences um, in the, that, that the play results in are, are um, uh, accelerate. You know? So I think that what's interesting is that Shakespeare is aware of the degree to which people can take literary models and try to apply them to life in a way that has destructive consequences for their life. I mean, it's actually a fascinating question because I think we read literature to understand life better. Um, many of us do anyway. And I, I think that, that Romeo uncritically reads the Petrarchan sonnet and the romantic ideals associated with it, takes it as a kind of reality that he then imitates in a way that brings him into collision with reality in a way that's fatal. You know, I, he's, it's, not, it's not unlike um, uh, Shakespeare's contemporary Cervantes's Don Quixote, right? Who takes a literary um, example and tries to bring it to life with comedic, but also um, destructive consequences to everyone around him. And there are later examples too. Flaubert's Madame Bovary, of course, is, is she's reading romance literature and she thinks that reality conforms to it and she she tries to play various roles that um, are not livable. I think that's another theme in the play. It's it's the kind of rashness um, uh, and and passion without any um, counterbalance that Shakespeare is also critiquing. The friar warns Romeo a number of times. He says to him that, you know, hot fires burn themselves out quickly. He warns him against stumbling if he doesn't stop and think through. So I think it's also Mercutio is the counterweight. And without him there reminding Romeo that there's another way of looking at romantic love, he, he's an extreme. It's just sex. Um, and everything else is just um, idealization. And, and you could easily find another to replace her, you know. When that counterbalance is, is removed, Romeo rushes to his destruction. So you would say then that the sonnets have their own built-in countervalence to uh, the traditional uh, idealization of... of yeah, the left within one. sonnets sometimes, but also among them. I think if you read them in isolation, you get a false sense of the tensions that Shakespeare is exploring about love, which if, if you read all of them, um, you see representations of both perspectives. It is interesting that he'll have one where the lead is, when my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies. And then you have another sonnet that leads with, let me not to the marriage of true minds mm-hmm. admit impediments, right. meaning it's got to be... Yeah. Straightforward and all or nothing. Otherwise, it's nonsense. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think there's a, another aspect to romantic love that Shakespeare recognizes and, and affirms in the comedies. And that is that he understands that um, passion is the, the, is the glue that kind of holds civilizations together, right? And, and holds societies together and that there's a positive aspect to that, right? So in, com- in comedy, he celebrates irrationality, right? Um, in tragedy, he shows it having destructive consequences. It's the same reality, right? Um, but but in, in, the, in the case of comedy, we see that there's a reason why so many of them end in weddings. Because, it, because despite the fact that human desire has this potential for um, destruction, in excess, in, 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 when it's in excess, it also um, has a potential and, and, f- and forms the basis of what holds people together and binds them together. So I think Shakespeare recognizes that it has the potential for both. And then comedy and tragedy are just different ways of articulating how the irrational 
plays a fundamental role in our lives. I actually think that Shakespeare recognized uh, the crucial role of irrationality in human life for both good and ill. It sounds like when Harold Bloom claims that it's not that we should use Freud to read Shakespeare, but that there's enough of Freud in Shakespeare that we can use Shakespeare to read oh, yeah, Freud, I, that I, he's I, way ahead of the game. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that completely. I mean, I, I think that um, the evidence is there. Shakespeare understands the complexity of, 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 of human desire. He understands the unconscious. Uh, he doesn't have a word for it. <laughs> we have to wait for Freud for a kind of theory of the unconscious, but it's it's definitely um, present and and he understands it. Shakespeare does inherit the kind of classical opposition between rationality and irrationality, and and uses that in his plays. But I, I think um, his any any of his characters who just espouse the view that. Um, humans are guided by reason and rationality, or often limited characters. So in A Midsummer Night's Dream, Theseus dismisses what's, ultimately dismisses what happens in the forest as, you know, you, you know if, if, you're, if you're in the forest in the dark, you, you know, you can suppose a, um, a, a bush to be a bear, right? And, and he kind of looks at all these things that have happened to them and, and he just dismisses them almost out of hand. But then you have, um, of course, um, uh, Benedict in um, Much Ado About Nothing, who has spent the whole play rejecting Beatrice, and, and, and they're, they're in conflict throughout the play. And then at the very end of the play, someone calls him out on it, and he says, well, man is a giddy thing. And it's celebrated, which is fascinating, because in tragedy, of course, it has much different effects. And you do have sonnets in which love and lust are so inextricably related to suspicion, jealousy, doubt, slavery, that right. it leads to almost a kind of madness. In fact, there is one in which he's saying, in essence, it's mad when it starts, it's mad as it develops, and he's talking about lust. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. every aspect of that level of uh, sexual passion uh, you're out of your mind, mm -hmm. and there is no way around that. We know that that's true, and yet we can't yeah. save ourselves. Basically, Shakespeare is talking about destructive sexual passion, right? And, and I think that translates directly into tragedy, um, where we see those kinds of destructive passions. Um, and as I was saying with comedy, I think sexual passion there can have an outcome that is, that is different, right? It can have an outcome that leads to regeneration and renewal. But the idea that, that someone is enslaved to another by passion is something that it always involves also being enslaved to one's own passion right? and subject to it. I think that's a theme that, that we see throughout um, the tragedies as well. So I, I, um, I really feel like the thematic material in the sonnets that reference love and explore the problem of love in that way um, uh, is, is, is found throughout all of his plays in one way, shape, or form. Right? One of the images that, that occurs throughout the Henry plays from Richard II through Henry V is, is the image of, um, of, of eating as a, as a, a kind of, uh, or, or de devouring. And, and this also actually shows up in Hamlet as well. There's a connection in Hamlet between gluttony, lust, and the desire for political power. So I think it's really simple to take a description of lust and show how it's connected to the desire for uh, political possession, right? To, whether it be as it is, let's say, in Henry IV. In Henry IV, we see the former allies of uh, Bolingbroke, Henry IV, now, now plotting against him with a map on the table, debating who is going to have what portion of the land. And so it's almost as if they're at the dinner table. They're parceling out the kingdom. And so that connection between lust, um, gluttony, and the, the lust for political power connects us 
to Richard II, Henry IV, parts one and two, Henry V, Hamlet, we see it particularly in the figure of Claudius, right? When, when, when um, the, the funeral meets have furnished the wedding table, right? That's a, one place where we see that particular image. And Claudius is also presented as lustful as well and gluttonous and as a gluttonous for political power. So I don't think there's anything to stop one from taking that image of lust and applying it other places and to other um, ideas, the desire for political power right, is a kind of lust. What would you say to a colleague who might say, look, you're a literary Marxist. Why do you devote so many of your courses to a guy who his father was practically the mayor of Stratford at times. He may not have gone to university, but he did well enough in his life that he bought one of the best houses. He hung around with patrons in order to have someone to address his poetry to. He was a friend of the Earl of Southampton. He performed for Queen Elizabeth, for King James. He was under their protectorate. He played at the courts. He wanted a coat of arms. This is a guy who wanted as much power and luxury as he could achieve. Why aren't you teaching someone who is more overtly on your side? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I think Shakespeare is on my side. I understand the question about his life and how he lived is one thing, but then his, his imagination as an artist, I think, is, is what is compelling, right? And, and, and as a literary Marxist, when I think of great literature, I think it's literature that, that um, gives voice to those who, who don't have a voice. That what Shakespeare is able to do, and this is what interests me in him a lot, is, is his ability to, um, with great empathy and imagination, um, represent the point of view and the experience of the dispossessed. My, so, so whatever his aspirations as a person, what he does as an artist, what his imagination is able to furnish us is these um, wonderfully compelling, emotionally um, packed um, appeals from um, those who are disenfranchised or, or whose voices may not be heard within the larger cultural um, and economic structure. So um, to provide us with poor Tom, right, in, in, uh, even though it's Edgar who's acting this out, to provide us with that perspective of the poor is quite um, extraordinary. To give us, even in, even in um, Hal's consorting with Falstaff and, and other, um, uh, other thieves, right, um, to give us a representation um, of the, those individuals and how they live to um, focus as he does consistently on the low characters. And one of the consistent aspects of Shakespeare's plots is to have a subplot. And that, su and that subplot is almost always comprised of subordinate but parallel peasants or, or lower um, uh, class individuals whose struggles often parody the struggles of the nobility, um, parallel them in, in, in similarity. Um, the message of that is actually quite extraordinary that no matter what class one finds oneself in, that the same kinds of basic human struggles apply. So I think that's another reason why I would be interested in another. And of course, his critique of political power um, is I find very compelling. I, he ultimately, manages to point out the um, hypocrisies of all authority, right? And, and he points out the falsehoods that they, they uh, purvey in order to stay in power. He critiques political authority as a, as a performance that really comes down to a land grab, and as, as in um, uh, Henry IV Part One, uh, part one where um, uh, all of uh, Bolingbroke's former supporters are now rebelling against him, as Richard uh, predicts in Richard II, right, that this will happen. Um, and, and so I think there's much to interest the literary Marxist in Shakespeare's works. I, I think 
whatever he was pursuing as an individual are not so is not so important um, as is um, the ability that he has to understand cultural systems and to look to get outside of them and to present us with critique of those of those things um, that calls them into question right it doesn't necessarily always suggest that they are um, wrong but 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 um, you know, calls them into question in some way. So I, I, I think that what all great literature does, if it's great literature, is to somehow give voice to a perspective that otherwise would not have been given voice. And therefore, often what it finds itself doing is giving voice to those who are... Um, dispossessed or silenced for some reason. And I think Shakespeare does that over and over again. Um, and he, you know, he gives us the voice of Shylock, right? Um, and he gives us the voice of women with, in countless places, but certainly with Amelia and Othello, who gives voice to the plight of women. Um, in, in, um, and then in, in As You Like It, we have Rosalind, right, who's, who is able to voice her, her, um, her uh, find voice as well. You know? So, so um, you know, I think there's much there to interest somebody who's politically engaged, um, um, and particularly a politically engaged Marxist. It is interesting that no matter how corrupt or weak a monarch might be, and however seemingly well-intentioned a rival to the throne might be, there's always a caution on Shakespeare's part that when you disrupt the system, there's always some measure of chaos. Yeah, I mean, I, I see the Henry plays as really being about that, right? I, Richard II, for all of his failings, is recognized as the rightful king according to divine right. Right? And so once you usurp him and usurp that system of legitimacy and call it into question, then you're setting the stage for violence. And of, of course, I think Shakespeare's interpretation of the War of the Roses is that Bolingbroke's usurpation of Richard II creates centuries of bloodshed. Um, he even says that, <laughs> more or less, I think, in Richard II. Um, and so... It's a really fascinating question. I mean, that um, do you stay with an unjust ruler or do you overthrow that ruler? Um, if you overthrow that ruler by, by in means that are not legitimate, then you set the stage for no real standard of legitimacy. And I, and I think Shakespeare does understand that. And that's why his sympathies to a degree remain with Richard, or at least um, he's exploring that problem. It's actually... Um, not too long after um, Shakespeare that Thomas Hobbes actually weighs in on this in Leviathan, right? Where he argues that um, it's never legitimate to disrupt a sovereign power because um, the consequence of that is civil war, which is so much worse than anything else you possibly can have that um, even a imperfect, unjust sovereign on the throne needs to be left on the throne. You know, it, it's, it's quite interesting how that evolves, right, to, um, you know, the, the basic principles of, um, of, uh, of uh, the United States, right, and, and, and the, the idea that um, the abuses of a ruler can lead to legitimate rebellion. It's not Hobbesian, <laughs> more Locke, right? But, I mean, these are how these things, I think, evolve from Shakespeare. Shakespeare, you can, I think, even though Shakespeare's writing before these things are discussed in political philosophy. Um, I think you can find those problems there, um, particularly in the Henry plays, since since you know Bolingbroke, his whole reign is characterized by rebellion. He never has a moment's peace after he does this, and then and and his advice to to Henry to Hal is start a foreign war. So you can distract people from the unrest at home, and then in Henry V, that's what we see, right? So, so um, yeah, I, I think the question of political legit legitimacy in Shakespeare is un un unresolved, right? He he interrogates the Machiavellian view that it's the prince who can manipulate, seize power, keep that power for the common good, that who will be. Um, uh, a legitimate ruler, but there's no moral legitimacy 
there. And I, I think at least what Shakespeare recognizes is that political leadership is not grounded in any kind of moral legitimacy, um, that there are other things at play. And it's hard to find a ruler in Shakespeare who really enjoys himself. So it's power itself that is held in suspicion in yeah, Shakespeare. Yeah, I think so. I mean, there, there's also um, a wonderful set of lines in Richard II when Richard is ceding the crown to Bolingbroke and, and tells him, you know, that my care is now your care, right? And the idea of the crown kind of weighing down the head of the ruler so that he or she has no time for anything else except the affairs of state is something that has a long history, but certainly it comes from the prince. Machiavelli's the prince, where Machiavelli says basically that a prince should concern himself in all of his activities with only one thing, and that is the art of war. Should go hunting on his land in case he's invaded, so he understands the layout of the land, goes on elaborately describing this. And I think Shakespeare shows us that in action with political, uh, with, with the monarchs that he represents to us. All of them are consumed with keeping their power once they, they acquire it. Um, it takes up all their care and all their concern um, uh, in a way that blinds them sometimes, to, and it tragically blinds them. And I see that, too, I think, in the sonnets, in the sense that they seem to be exemplifying the adage that when the gods wish to punish us, they answer our prayers. Right. You might win the beloved, but then you can't control what happens around that relationship. Someone else might win the beloved away from you. Right. Um, you might be tortured by your own lust mm -hmm. for that person. Right. The idea of what you achieve, that power that you're grasping for, it has its own pitfalls and potential catastrophe. Yeah, I mean, I, a, a king becomes enslaved to the affairs of state. Right? Um, and um, this was yeah, kind of fascinating about Henry IV, Part One. right? We, we see how shirking his responsibilities, right? He's supposed to be the heir apparent, and yet he is... Um, engaging in this life of pleasure, and that's what it is. I mean, it's, it's the subplot. The subplot is this life of pleasure in the tavern, and, and we have um, ways in which the tavern and what's happening there critiques the court, and vice versa. The court critiques this life of irresponsibility that, that, that Hal is leading. But Shakespeare is more clever than that, too, because we see Hal at the end of Act I and Henry IV claiming in a a soliloquy. So it's what he's thinking. And, and critics have a lot of trouble dealing with this if they want to see Hal as not a Machiavellian kind of calculating character. He claims that I'm doing this all in preparation for when I will seize the crown. I'm doing this um, to learn about the people so that I can better exercise power. There are some who'd like to dismiss that as some kind of anomaly because they don't see how they see Hal in a much more favorable light. I think it's hard to dismiss, though, because it is a soliloquy. So it means that no one else is present on the stage. These are his thoughts. They are true. Um, and nowhere else, you know, we see later in Henry V, we see Henry saying all kinds of things about the common good, but he's saying them in the presence of others. So I think that's also an interesting device that Shakespeare uses often is his ability to give us interiority or not um, and choose to withhold it uh, in, in certain cases um, for the purposes of, of the drama. Um, and he chooses to tell us that about Hal, that Hal's thinking that, um, which makes it clear that he can't be looked upon as the, the, um, the kind-hearted, entirely as the kind-hearted individual who falls into power unwillingly. Right? He's, he's got a plan, and he's following that plan. And I think that relates to the idea that there's almost no palace or mansion or even kingdom where he's not also focused on the less privileged, and the servants, and the outcasts, right. the madmen, the yeah. fools. And they all, the, those outcasts, those less, less pri privileged are often, um, the fools are often the ones who have the wisdom. You know, so they're the ones who see, um, while the, the nobility are the ones who are often blind.
Well, last question. This is 2016. Why are we still performing, teaching, uh, discussing, uh, celebrating? I have two answers for that, <laughs> actually. I, one is, I think, that there's a tradition, and, and that that tradition has been that um, every generation has read and commented on Shakespeare, that institutions, universities have kept that tradition alive and it continues to be taught um, because Shakespeare has been canonized, right? I mean, I, I think that's a, it's a, a functional definition. Um, I don't think it's enough. Um, because there are those who would dismiss Shakespeare for that reason and say, well, it's just a, um, a bunch of mainly white males who have um, you know, canonized this individual and continue to teach his works because it supports their privilege, right? That's the argument, or so it goes. I think this, that's true to a degree, but also I think um, that goes against what I was saying before against Shakespeare's ability to depict the voices of the marginalized and to depict um, the disenfranchised and the ostracized. Um, I, mean, I, I think that it's the power of the, the themes and the issues that he addresses, the, the power with which he addresses themes that are of still of central concern to humanity. Right? And, and I guess I would define any great author as, as that as having a lasting significance to the degree that they can depict the complexity of human um, struggle, um, depict the complexity of certain themes that seem to have defined the struggle of humanity um, in ways that are complex, but also um, uh, aesthetically beautiful. You know, I, I don't want to leave that out. I mean, I think you can't ignore the power of Shakespeare's language and, and the way um, once you delve into it and, and sort of even try to unpack a sonnet, right, or a single passage from a work, how compelling that, that process becomes, or at least that's my experience. I, I, I find the engagement with Shakespeare and the texts are sometimes difficult. Um, I've read a lot of it for many years, so the language becomes more accessible. You kind of can just read it readily as you would read contemporary English uh, a lot of the time, which, which students can't can often do, right? And this is why they struggle with it. But I think once you begin to delve into the complexity of his metaphor and the poetic language that he uses and the imagery with which he describes human problems, he is among the most gifted writers in human history. I grant them that. And I think that as long as those ideas continue to be compelling and, um, and, and, and the language with which he describes it is compelling, then they will have an enduring significance. What's the difference between teaching young people, which you do, and on the same campus, adults? Is there a fundamental difference? Yeah, I, I experience in life, absolutely. And um, eagerness uh, to learn that is sometimes absent from young people. I, I'm not, I'm not going to write off an entire generation, but I think that um, teaching folks at Hutton House who have, ha have vast experience in life, who are eager to read and eager to learn um, uh, uh, are what we call in, human in liberal arts and sciences lifelong learners, um, is different from, from teaching those who one wants to shape into lifelong learners, if that makes any sense. That, I don't have to make an argument to anybody at Hutton House that reading this stuff is worthwhile. I do have to make that argument to a lot of college students that, it, 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 that, that it's worthwhile to put in the time and effort to grapple with Shakespeare, to try and understand the language. Um, and so that means it is different because I have to spend a lot of time um, persuading. Right? and, and uh, about its value rather than, than teaching those who are already persuaded of its value. And all, all I have to do then is, is try and understand its complexity and convey it as best I can. Um, there's a lot more that has to go along with teaching young college students who, who some buy in, but even the ones who buy in sometimes need more convincing. You know, why shouldn't I go out with my friends and 
and, and have a good time or why should I devote another, you know, another five or six hours to reading this and reread it again, right? Graduate students, they're usually there and they kind of understand the, the reason why, but, but undergraduates, not so much all the time. Do you get asked why they should have to read it given that the language is so different? I try to answer that question in advance, actually, before they ask me. I think there are a lot of reasons. I think grappling with complex texts teaches a lot of things. Critical thinking, problem solving, gives them a sense of the complexity of human experience that if they understand it, will benefit them in many ways. But of course, the, the, for me, the most compelling reason to read and for them to read and grapple with Shakespeare is to develop and refine their capacity for empathy. That to me, that the, the, if we want to make an argument for why literature in general is relevant, it's that. Because there are so many, other, so few places where that capacity is now developed. I'm willing to defend reading literature for, as for pleasure myself, but that's not, that's a hard sell um, these days with a lot of people. But the practical um, uh, value of learning to adopt different perspectives, to understand um, the kinds of, um, especially with complex literary characters, the kind of complexity of their um, emotions and, and, and um, responses to dramatic situations in which they find themselves um, is immensely valuable in being able to um, infer or relate to the emotions or, or perspective of, of others. You know, I, think it's, I think it's political. It's a lot harder to justify killing another person for some kind of cause if um, you, ha if, if you um, have a little, developed a little bit of imagination and empathy and, um, and, and enough to recognize them as another human being like you with a, with a um, set of emotions and needs and desires that resemble your own. I think if you really develop that capacity, it's impossible to justify killing anybody. So I, I, think, I think that's, for me, the most compelling political um, uh, uh, lesson that we can draw from literature, right? Because there's so many um, extremisms in the world today that, that are mobilized and justified by the absence of imagination and empathy. It's an interesting way of viewing Shakespeare, that his work is a ground on which to develop the faculty of empathy. Because you, ha you have to grapple with it. I mean, I think the language, because the language is not so readily accessible, it requires that en engagement. I mean, I, th that's what I think great literature does, too. You have to struggle with it. It, it can't be easy. The harder it is, the better, as long as you're willing to grapple with it and try and wrestle with what these great minds are doing. And it requires that. To understand the language requires, they, they go together, you know. And even though in Shakespeare's day, I think there would be much more ready understanding, no, no barrier of language. I think you, that barrier of language can be made to work for you. You can't understand any of it without rereading it and line by line and then going back. and. That's close reading anyway, anything. <laughs>